Welcome. Let's bow our heads for prayer to ask for the Lord's guidance. Our loving Father, what a privilege it is to call you our Father. We ask that as we open your holy word today, as we begin this series on the identity of the 24 elders, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to instruct us, help us to understand this very complex subject and how it applies to our own personal walk with Jesus. We thank you for your presence and for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of our study today is Mission Accomplished. And I'd like to begin our study by going to John chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3. John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. These verses are so well known that probably most of you could repeat them from memory. There's one particular point that I want to underline in these three verses. There, the beloved disciple wrote this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And now comes the point that I want to underline. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. This text tells us that Jesus was the creator of everything. In other words, Jesus is responsible for our existence. Now we need to understand that Jesus is not responsible for our sin, but Jesus is responsible for our existence because we did not ask to exist. He was the one who created us, and He is responsible over the fact that we exist. Now, you might be saying, well, that's kind of unjust. I'm born into this world. I did not choose to be born into this world, and, uh, and so that's not fair. Well, it wouldn't be fair unless Jesus had given us a chance to escape the sin as it exists in this world. In other words, if Jesus had created us, and simply said, well, you fell into sin, there's nothing I can do for you, we would have problems with that because we didn't choose to fall into that condition. But as long as Jesus has given us a way of escape, He is not responsible for us being lost. In other words, we don't choose to come into this world, but we can choose how we will go out of this world. He has given us a way of escape. And so this text tells us that Jesus created everyone. Now, when I say this, there's always people who say, well, you know, I wasn't created by Jesus, I was born from my mother. And so I say, okay, you were born from your mother, and who was your mother born from? Well, she was born from her mother. And who was her mother born from? Well, she was born from her mother. Now, if you go all the way back to the beginning, where does the sequence end? It ends with Adam and Eve. When Jesus created Adam and Eve, He created every single human being that descended from them. In other words, Jesus is responsible for our existence. Jesus created everyone on planet Earth. Now when Jesus created this world, He created Adam and Eve and He placed Adam as the king over this realm or over this territory. I'd like to uh, invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm 8 verses 3 to 5. Psalm 8 verses 3 to 5, we're going to talk about the original individual that God uh, established on this earth to rule over the earth. It says in Psalm 8 verse 3, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? You have made him, speaking about the creation of Adam, you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have what? Crowned him. Now, who is it that uses crowns? Kings use crowns. So Adam was created to be a what? A king. His position was the position of king or ruler. And so it says, For you have made him a little lower than the angels, you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. Now, every king has a realm over which he rules, right? And so Adam was created to be king. He must have had a territory over which he should rule, 
or a realm over which he should rule. What was that realm? Verse 6, once again, you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. That expression under his feet means that you have placed him as a ruler. Now what was under his feet? Verse 7, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. Now when the Bible uses the expression beasts of the field, birds of the air, and fish of the waters, it says it means everything connected with planet earth, sky, earth, and waters. In other words, Adam was created to occupy the position of king and his realm or his territory over which he ruled was planet earth. But in order for Adam to continue ruling over planet earth, he had to render perfect obedience to God's holy law. In other words, he could not deviate from God's law in the minutest detail. You see, the law of God requires absolute sinless perfection. The law says, offer me sinless perfection and you will live forever. Unfortunately, the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve chose to sin. And when they sinned, another individual took over the position of Adam as king and took over the territory over which he ruled. Notice Luke chapter 4 and verses 5 through 7. Luke chapter 4 and verses 5 through 7. This is speaking about the moment when the devil took Jesus up into a high mountain uh, to uh, tempt him. And you'll notice what the devil says to Christ. Luke 4 verses 5 through 7. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Did you notice that, it, that the devil is showing him the realm, showing him the kingdoms of the world? Now notice what he continues saying. He shows him all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and verse 6 states, And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory. What does authority imply? That's talking about the fact that the devil is saying, I am the ruler, I'm the one who governs over the kingdoms of the world. So do you notice the two aspects? Adam was created to be king, and the realm of his dominion was the planet earth. In Luke chapter 4, the devil is saying, look, I have the kingdoms of the world, that's the realm, and he says, and I have the authority over those kingdoms. In other words, I rule as king over those kingdoms. And then the devil says, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Who gave the position of king and the territory into the hands of his enemy? It was Adam. And so the devil is saying, the kingdom and the realm of dominion has been given into my hands. I am now the king, and this is my realm of dominion. Now the Bible tells us that everyone who descended from Adam is also a sinner. In other words, there's no one on planet earth that can offer the law the sinless perfection that the law requires. And so because the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, all of us are slaves and all of us have lost our territory, our position of dominion. So the question is, how could man recover the lost throne or the dominion and recover the lost territory over which Adam was placed to rule originally? The answer to this question is found in the laws of redemption in the Old Testament. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 25, and then we will also read verses 47 to 49. In Israel, every Israelite was given a plot of land over which they were sovereign rulers. Uh, but what would happen if an individual sold that plot of land? Could that plot of land or that territory be recovered in some way? And what if an individual sold himself from being lord over his dominion, he sold himself into slavery, could 
he be delivered from his position of slavery and once again be placed as ruler over his domain? The answer is yes, but there was a specific prescription that needed to take place. Leviticus 25 and verse 25 tells us what would happen if an individual sold his possession, that is his territory. It says, if one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, and if his redeeming relative, the word redeeming there means to buy back by paying a price, that's what the Hebrew word means. And so if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Who was supposed to be the redeemer? It was supposed to be a relative or a what? Or a brother according to this. So could a brother or a relative pay the price to buy back the possession that had been sold? Absolutely. Now what would happen if an individual sold himself into servanthood or into slavery? Could he once again be emancipated so that he could occupy his position as ruler over his territory? The answer is yes. Go with me to Leviticus 25 and verses 47 to 49. Now if a sojourner or stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor, and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner close to you, or to a member of the stranger's family, after he is sold, see he sold himself into servanthood, it says after he is sold he may be what? Redeemed. That word goel in the Old Testament means to buy something back by paying the price that is required to buy it back. So verse 48 says, after he is sold, he may be redeemed again. Who could redeem him? One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle, or his uncle's son may redeem him, or anyone who is near of kin to him in his family may redeem him, or if he is able, he may redeem himself. Of course, he couldn't redeem himself because he had sold himself into slavery. That's a hypothetical statement. But it's interesting to notice that if an individual sold himself, the only way in which he could recover his lordship, so to speak, was if a next of kin, a close relative, would pay the price to buy back his freedom or to buy back the territory which he had sold. The problem is, with regards to the redemption of the position that Adam lost, there was no one in the human race that could recover the throne that Adam lost. Because we all became servants, because we all sold ourselves to sin. There was no one within the human race that could recover the lost possession, the lost territory. Because all of us sold our patrimony by being sinners. You see, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 3 and verse 10, there is none, none righteous, no, not one. And in verse 23 he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the human race was in a very tough predicament because there was no one within humanity who could redeem what had been lost. There was no next of kin that could pay the price to buy back the position of sovereignty and to buy back the territory that had been sold. Now this is the reason why Jesus Christ came to this earth. Let me ask you, was Jesus our next of kin before he became incarnate? Was Jesus a member of our family because before his incarnation? No, he wasn't a member of our family. Whose family did he belong to? He belonged to the family of the Godhead, right? the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He was a member of a different family. So could Jesus apply the laws of redemption when he was a member of a different family and he was not our next of kin? Absolutely not. What needed to happen in order for Jesus to be able to fulfill the laws of redemption? He had to become our brother or he had to become our next of kin. Are you understanding me? And so Jesus gathered all of the angelic hosts, all of the heavenly beings together, and he said, folks, I am going to leave for planet earth, and I am going to face Goliath in place of all of those slaves down there who have lost their patrimony. 
I am going to fight with the enemy down there. But in order to do it, I have to become one of them. I have to join their family. And so we're told in John chapter 1 and verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus, by His incarnation, became our next of kin. He became our brother, and therefore He could pay the, pay the price to buy back the lost possession and to buy back our rulership or our sovereignty. Are you following me or not? And so Jesus says to the heavenly beings gathered there, He says, I'm leaving. I'm going to be gone for 33 years. And during those 33 years in human flesh, being next of kin to those people down there who have lost their possession and they have lost their position, I am going to do battle with the enemy in their place. And I assure you, He says to the heavenly beings, that 33 years from now I will be back and I will be a victorious war hero, so you better start preparing the party. And then Jesus, by a mystery that we can never understand, was implanted in the womb of Mary, and He became our next of kin. He became our brother. Now you know, it's interesting to notice that Jesus actually belonged to two families. Take for example David. In Revelation 22 and verse 16, we're told that Jesus is the root and offspring of David. Now that's interesting. He, in other words, He is the creator of David and is also the son of David. He's the root and offspring of David. The Bible also tells us that Jesus is the father of Abraham and He is the son of Abraham. We're told in Matthew chapter 1 that Jesus was the seed of Abraham. But Jesus in John chapter 8 told the Jews that were gathered there, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. In other words, Jesus is Abraham's father and he is Abraham's son. And you say, that's absurd. An individual cannot be his father's son and his son's son. It's impossible. But Jesus actually was father, of Abraham and he was also son of Abraham. He was father of David and he was also the son of David. The father of Abraham and David as God and the son of Abraham and David as man. Jesus became flesh of our flesh and bone of our bones. And Jesus had two things that he needed to fulfill in his mission. You see the law of God demands absolute sinless perfection. No one in the human race can offer the law what the law requires. And therefore the law says, if you don't offer me the perfection that I require, you must die. So what did Jesus come to this earth for? He came to do two things. Number one, He came to live the perfect life that the law requires in my place. And then at the end of a perfect life, which He lived in our place, Jesus took all of our sins upon Himself and He was punished for our sins. He suffered the death penalty that we should suffer. In other words, Jesus had to come to live the life that the law requires from us. And He came to die the death that the law requires from us as sinners. He came to live a perfect life and He came to die in our place. He lived for us and He died for us. Do you know that this is illustrated in the sanctuary service? Notice Exodus chapter 12 and verses 5 and 6. You know, usually when we start the study of the sanctuary, we usually begin in the court where the altar of sacrifice is. That's not the proper way, place to begin the study of the sanctuary. The proper place to begin the study of the sanctuary is in the camp where the sinners, sinners live. You see, before Jesus went to the cross, which is illustrated by the altar, the Lord Jesus came and lived in our midst. He lived a perfect life. He was tempted in all things such as we are, yet He did not sin. You see, in the sanctuary, these two roles of Christ, His perfect life and His death for sin, are illustrated by the Lamb. Now you know the Lamb was sacrificed, but before the Lamb was sacrificed, they had to be absolutely certain that the Lamb did not have any what? Any blemish or any defect. 
In other words, the fact that the lamb didn't have any blemish or defect represents the perfect life of Christ, whereas the sacrifice of the lamb represents the death of Christ. Two functions, one in the camp where he lived his perfect life in our midst, and then the altar of sacrifice where he suffered death in our place. Notice Exodus chapter 12 and verses 5 and 6 where this is brought out clearly. Speaking about the Passover lamb, it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you, keep, you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Do you notice two things regarding the lamb? First of all, they had to be sure that it had no blemish. That's the perfect life of Christ. And then secondly, they had to slay the lamb that had no blemish. Perfect life of Christ and his death for sin in our place. Now this is also spoken of in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 20. Here the apostle Peter says, knowing that you were not redeemed, notice the word redeemed that we studied before, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, there you have his death, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, there you have his perfect life, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for you. So my question is, what was the function of Jesus in taking upon himself human flesh? Jesus came to this world to live a perfect life in obedience to the law in our place. He came to this world to bear our sins and to die in our place. He came to live for all, and He came to die for all. And He could do that because He was the Creator of all. Only He who created all could offer Himself to take the place of all. Are you following me or not? And so Jesus bid farewell to heaven. He says, I'm going to go down there for 33 years. I'm going to live a perfect life. I'm never going to disobey the law. And then even though I'm a perfect lamb, at the end of my life, I'm going to be killed because I'm going to be bearing the sins of the world. I'm going to offer my life a ransom for many. Now, do you think that the devil knew why Jesus had come and who he was? Oh, yes, he did. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. The demons knew who he was and why he had come. They knew that he had come to destroy them and to restore Adam to his original position of rulership and to the territory which he had lost. It says there in Mark 1, 23 and 24, Jesus is in the synagogue on a Sabbath. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? And now notice, did you come to what? To destroy us? Did they know why he had come? Oh yes, did they know who he was? Let's continue reading. Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now if the mission of Christ was to come and live a perfect life in our place, and to offer his life as a sacrifice for sin in our place, what do you suppose the devil's mission was? Well, it's very simple. The devil's mission was simply to keep Jesus from living his perfect life and to keep Jesus from offering his life as a sacrifice for sin. In other words, the devil's mission was to keep Jesus from doing what he came to do, which was to live his perfect life and to die for sin. And so the devil, 24-7-365, was after Christ to try and keep him from living a perfect life, trying to get him to sin, and trying to keep him from offering his life as a sacrifice for sin. And the devil used four methods to try and prevent Jesus from being successful in his mission. The first method that the devil used was try to kill Jesus Christ before he reached the point 
where he was supposed to offer his own life as a ransom for many. You see, if the devil had killed Jesus before the hour of Jesus had arrived, that would not count as a sacrifice for sin because it was not acceptable if his life was taken. He had to offer his life. So the devil says, if I can kill him before he offers his life, then the plan of salvation will not be successful. And that's why constantly in the, in the Gospel of John we find the expression, they could not lay hands on him because his hour had not yet come. His time had not yet come. They could do nothing to him as long as the moment for him to offer his life had not come. Did the devil attempt to kill Christ on several occasions? Yes, he did. When was the first occasion? When he was born. The devil says, I'm going to nip this in the bud. I'm going to get rid of him when he is born. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and verses 3 and 4. Revelation 12 verses 3 and 4. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as he was born. And of course we know the way in which that occurred. The devil influenced King Herod to kill all of the male children in the hopes of killing the rival to his throne, which the devil is really saying to Herod, you know, if you let him live, he's going to take your throne, but the devil is thinking, if I let him live, he's going to take my throne. And so we find the devil attempting to kill Christ from the moment of his birth. Another time there was a storm on a lake. It was a storm out of season. The fishermen were out on the lake. It was not expected that there would be a storm and there was this horrific storm. And Jesus was sleeping in the boat. Who do you suppose knew that Jesus was sleeping in the boat? Who causes storms? Satan causes storms. He says, I'm going to drown this man. On another occasion, Jesus was preaching in the synagogue in Nazareth. This is found in Luke chapter 4, verses 28 to 30. And Jesus said some things that the Jews didn't like. Like, uh, you know, in the times of Elijah and uh, in the times of, of Naaman, the Syrian, God favored the Gentiles instead of the Jews. And they were really angry at Jesus. And so the Bible tells us that they pushed Jesus outside the city and they were going to throw him over a cliff. Ellen White tells us in Desire of Ages that there were demons disguised as men there, egging on the, the group of individuals, the, the multitude, to throw Jesus over the cliff. The devil was trying to kill Christ. On several occasions during the ministry of Jesus, they picked up stones to try and stone Christ. But the Bible says that he would walk in their midst and they could not find him. So the devil says, I need to kill him before the moment comes for him to offer his life voluntarily for sin. It didn't work. The devil used a second method to try and get Jesus to fail in his ministry. The devil tried to infect Jesus with the virus of sin. Three times on the Mount of Temptation the devil tried to get Jesus to sin. And each time the Lord Jesus responded by saying, It is written. I live by what God says in His word and in His law. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, Jesus refused on the Mount of Temptation to allow Himself to be infected with the virus of sin, because if He had, He would have been an imperfect sacrifice, and His sacrifice would not have been accepted. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, we're were uh, uh, told about the perfect sinlessness of Christ. It says there, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was perfectly sinless. He did not allow the devil to infect him with the virus of sin because he had, a, had to be a perfect lamb, a perfect sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26 speaks also about the perfect sinlessness of Christ. It says, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Notice the terminology, holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. In John chapter 8, Jesus was speaking to a group of Jews, and he uh, threw out this question, 
in John 8 verse 46 where he said, which of you convicts me of sin? In other words, who of you can convince me that I am a sinner? And of course it's a rhetorical question, nobody could say that he was a sinner. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5, once again we have a description of the perfect sinlessness of the life of Christ. It says there, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. One final verse on the perfect sinlessness of Christ, 1 Peter chapter 2, in verses 21 and 22. Here Peter says, inspired by God's Spirit, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Jesus committed no what? Jesus committed no sin. Jesus came to live the life that the law requires from us. He came to live a perfect life. The devil says, I'm not going to allow him to do it. So the devil was after him 24-7, 365, but each time Jesus refused to allow the devil to infect him with the virus of sin. He lived his perfect life. The devil could not kill him and the devil could not infect him. So the devil says, what I'm going to do is distract him from the cross. I'm going to distract him and lead him to choose a different path or a different way of getting the throne back. So the third method of the devil is to distract him from having to live and die in place of man, offering him an easy way. And of course, the easier way is to offer Jesus the throne without Jesus having to suffer and to die. Now, let me ask you, did the devil on repeated occasions try to get Jesus to take a detour, a different way of getting the throne of the world back? Yes. On the Mount of Temptations, the devil says, look, here's all the kingdoms of the world and all the authority. I have those because Adam gave them to me. He says, you don't have to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. No, no, no. All you have to do is bow down and worship me for an instant and you will be the king without any suffering and without any agony. Jesus says, no way. That's not the way. The way of the cross leads home. In John chapter 6 and verse 15, Jesus had just fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. And the Bible tells us that the people were so impressed that they wanted to make Jesus our temporal king. And by the way, the ringleader was Judas Iscariot. Constantly the disciples wanted Jesus to take the throne. Now Jesus had to win the throne back, but not in that way. The devil tried to distract him, getting him to choose a different path. In John 6 and verse 15, after feeding the 5,000, we're told this, Therefore when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Six months before his death, Jesus asked his disciples, Who are men saying that I am? And the disciples say, well, some people say that you're Jeremiah, Somebody, some say that you're Elijah, others say that you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, who appeared to be the spokesman for the disciples, said, oh, you are the Christ, which means the Messiah. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus now says to Peter, Peter, well said. Flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my Father in heaven did, because Peter didn't even know what he was confessing. You say, how do we know that he didn't know what he was saying? Yeah, he knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but he had wrong in his mind the kind of Messiah. In fact, Jesus immediately afterwards, in Matthew chapter 16, in verses 22 and 23, uh, Jesus says, I must go to Jerusalem, I must suffer, I'm going to be killed, and I will resurrect the third day. And when Jesus says that, Peter is indignant. Notice the story in Matthew 16, 22 and 23. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Imagine Peter rebuking the master, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Whose emissary was Peter at that point? Who was trying to say to Jesus, No, you don't die, Messiah rules. Notice verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Wow. He wasn't talking to Peter, he was talking to whom? To the devil who was using Peter. Get behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me, 
for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now after Peter's confession, the disciples began their journey with Christ towards Jerusalem. This was Christ's last journey to Jerusalem. And the disciples are disturbed because Jesus has said he's going to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. They kind of didn't hear that he said that he had resur would resurrect the third day because they were so focused on his sufferings and on his death. And so for six days, the Bible tells us that they're walking behind Jesus and they're sad and, you know, they say, we're going to Jerusalem. He said he's going to be killed. He's going to die there. And six days later, Jesus knows that they're terribly discouraged. And so he takes three of his disciples up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And the Bible says that he is transfigured in their presence. He looked like he will look at his second coming. In other words, he was trying to tell them, hey, after the suffering comes the glory. As a result of what I'm going to do in Jerusalem, I will be glorif glorified someday and I will come again. Not as the suffering servant, but as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And, and Moses and Elijah appeared, speaking to Christ on the mountain and encouraging Jesus. And then when this scene ends, Peter still didn't get it. Peter, he knew that they were on their way to Jerusalem. He says, Lord, it is good for us to stay here. <laughs> Let's not go to Jerusalem. It is good to stay here. Let's build three tabernacles and just stay here. It was a temptation to stay. You remember that towards the end of the life of Christ, during the last week of his life, some Greeks came for an interview to speak with Jesus. See, they wanted Jesus to go to Greece to speak the beautiful things that he had spoken and to perform his marvelous signs. And so they come to Jesus for an interview and they talk to Philip and Philip talks to Andrew. And when they say to Jesus, the Greeks want to speak to you, Jesus said something that is very strange. Let's read about this in John 12, verses 20 to 24. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And now notice the strange answer of Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. In other words, the hour for me is not to go to Greece, the hour is now to be glorified, to die and to resurrect and to be exalted. Then he says this, Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. What he's saying is, if I go to Greece now, people will believe that they, but they can't be saved. Because in order to be saved, there has to be a perfect life and a death for sin in their place. And so they'll heal my hear my beautiful words, and they will be healed by my marvelous works, but they won't be saved. He says the only way in which they can truly be saved is if a seed of wheat or a grain of wheat falls into the earth, that grain of wheat is Jesus, and dies, it then germinates, it becomes a plant, and it produces much fruit. Jesus says, if I die and I am buried, I will sprout to new life, and then there will be many people saved in the kingdom. The devil was trying to distract Jesus from going to the cross to go to Greece to preach the gospel. He was even using something positive to try and distract Jesus from the way of the cross. Even when Judas betrayed Jesus Christ. You know, some people think that Judas betrayed Christ because he wanted Christ to be crucified. No, 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 no. That's not what the gospel says. Judas betrayed Christ because he wanted to put Jesus between a rock and a hard place. He wanted to pressure Jesus into retaliating against those who arrested him and to proclaim himself king. He wanted to pressure Jesus into taking over the kingdom. You say, how do we know that? Hey, if it was the intention of Judas to, that Jesus be crucified, he wouldn't have committed suicide. When he saw that Jesus was being crucified, he would have said, hey, my plan worked perfectly. But what happened when he saw that Jesus did not escape and did not proclaim himself king? The Bible says that he went and he threw the money. See, money meant nothing for this covetous man anymore. He threw the money there in front of the priest and he said, I have betrayed innocent blood. And the Bible says that he went and he committed suicide. You see, once again, the devil was using, in fact, the Bible says that the devil entered Judas. That's what the Bible says. 
and through Judas the devil was trying to pressure Jesus into taking the throne in a different way than living a perfect life and dying for sin. The devil used a fourth method and this was the most terrible method of all, the most trying for Jesus Christ. Basically the fourth method was to discourage Jesus in such a way that he would pick up and that he would leave where he was loved in heaven. Do you know that Jesus at any point during his ministry could have chosen to go back to heaven and allow the human race to perish? And the devil, especially at the end of the life of Christ, tried to discourage Jesus in such a way that Jesus would simply say, it's not worth staying here. I'm going back to heaven where I am loved. Let's notice several verses in the final days, in the final hours of the life of Christ. Matthew 26 and verse 38. Jesus speaks to his disciples when he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Stay here and watch with me. Notice Jesus is filled with sorrow as he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then in chapter 26, in verses 39, 42, and 44, Jesus three times begs the Father that if it's possible, the cup might be taken from him. Notice Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39. It says, He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Verse 42. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And then verse 44 tells us, So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Let me ask you, what was it that was contained in that cup that Jesus had to drink? Folks, it was the wrath of of his father. That word cup that is used there is the same word that is used in Revelation 16 where it speaks about the bowls of God's wrath being poured out upon the earth. The word bowl in Revelation 16 is the same word cup here. Jesus was going to drink the wine of the wrath of God because he was bearing the sins of the whole world upon himself. Who gave him that cup? His Father gave him that cup. Notice John chapter 18 and verse 11. John chapter 18 and verse 11. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. This is when he cut off the, the ear of the servant of the high priest. Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? Why would the Father give Jesus the cup of his wrath? It's because Jesus was carrying upon himself the sins of the whole world, the punishment for sin. He had lived the perfect life, and the devil is saying to Jesus, if you go through with this, you will never see your father's face ever again. You better leave while you can. In fact, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7 describes the agony of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. The devil was torturing the heart of Jesus with his temptations according to the desire of ages, telling him, listen, leave now while you can or else you are going to be lost and everyone else is going to be lost. And Jesus, you know, he wanted the encouragement of his disciples. He says, pray, pray for me. And three times he finds them sleeping and the devil is saying to Jesus, oh, your disciples sure love you a lot, don't they? They're sleeping while you are agonizing, trying to discourage Christ. It says in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, speaking about the suffering of Jesus in Gethsemane, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Notice the expressions, prayers, supplications, cries and tears he's raising up to his father. In fact, his agony was so great that instead of sweating sweat, the Bible says that he sweated blood. Luke chapter 22 and verse 44 says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly 
Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Ellen White in Desire of Ages, page 753, expresses the agony. And let me interject before I read that statement something very important. Jesus did not die from his wounds. Do you know that Ellen White tells us that Jesus would have died in the Garden of Gethsemane before one finger was placed on him? if it hadn't been for an angel that was sent to strengthen him. That's before anything happened to Jesus, before one finger was placed on him. She says he fell dying to the ground, and an angel was sent to revive him so that he would not die. Jesus did not die because of his wounds. Jesus died because of the weight of sin of the whole world that he was bearing upon himself after living his perfect life. Ellen White says, Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see beyond, through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of his sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Imagine that, the devil is saying, the separation is going to be eternal. Then she says, Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. And do you know something, folks? Jesus said to his disciples, he said to Peter after he cut off the ear, he says, put away that sword. Don't you know that if I wanted to, I could call right now 12 legions of angels and they would deliver me? In other words, Jesus is saying, I could leave right now if I wanted to. I don't have to go through with this. Imagine the devil says to Jesus, huh, your disciples really care for you, don't they? One of them betrayed you. The other one denied you. And all of the rest of them scampered away. And they slipped when you asked them to pray for you. Hey, not even your disciples are going to be saved, much less the human race. Pick up and leave while you can. The Bible tells us that Jesus was beaten and he was punched. They spit in his face. The purpose of the devil is to either get Jesus to leave and to go where he's appreciated or else for Jesus to retaliate and in this way sin and ruin the plan of salvation. We're told in Mark chapter 14 and verse 65, then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy, and the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. In Mark chapter 15, verses 16 through 20, we find how Jesus was treated. The devil is causing this because he wants Jesus either to retaliate or he wants Jesus to leave. It says there in Mark chapter 15, verse 16, Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they struck him on the head with a reed, and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Do you know that even while Jesus hung on the cross, the devil tried to entice him to come down from the cross? There were individuals gathered at the foot of the cross that actually said to Jesus, if you're really the Son of God, come down and prove it. They were breathing the words of the devil. Notice Matthew 27, verses 41 to 43. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. But Jesus would not be discouraged. He was going to go to the tomb, even if it meant eternal separation from his Father. That's how much Jesus loves us. In John 8, in verse 29, Jesus explained that his Father was always with him. 
In fact, it says there, Jesus is speaking, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. So Jesus says, the Father's always with me. He's never left me alone. But listen carefully. Matthew 27, verse 46 tells us that when Jesus hung on the cross, he could not feel the presence of his Father. In fact, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why hast thou forsaken me? You walked with me all during my life, but now I don't feel your presence. Why have you forsaken me? And then Jesus says on the cross, It is finished. And as we will notice in our next lecture in this series, Jesus was actually speaking those words to his Father. Jesus was saying, I have lived the perfect life that the law requires, and now I am bearing the sins of the world. Salvation is finished. There's a perfect life, and there's a death for sin available to every repentant human being who comes confessing his sin and trusting in me. It is finished. John 19, verse 30 says, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. But do you know what? Luke tells us that Jesus said one last thing after he said, It is finished. This is found in Luke 23 and verse 46. Luke 23, verse 46. Now listen, folks. Jesus felt forsaken by his Father. We just read it. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He could not see beyond the portals of the tomb. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that the separation would be eternal. And yet Jesus, the last words that he pronounces on the cross are found in Luke 23, verse 46, where we are told, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Do you know what Jesus was saying? Jesus was saying, Father, you promised that if I was faithful, that if I lived a perfect life, and that if I offered my life as a ransom for sin, that you would preserve my spirit and that you would resurrect me from, my, from the dead. Father, into your hands I'm commending my spirit because you have promised that the third day you are going to give me my spirit back. You are going to resurrect me and I will be alive again. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So Jesus did not die a dejected and pessimistic life. Jesus feels separated from his Father, but he says, Father, I claim your promise that you will return to me my spirit. You will preserve my spirit, and you will return to me my self-identity. You will make me who I was in life on the third day when I resurrect from the dead. Jesus died on what is known as Good Friday. He rested in the tomb on the Sabbath. Very early on the first day of the week, two angels descended from heaven. One of them removed the stone. <laughs> you know, the devil was trying to keep Jesus in the tomb. <laughs> it kind of makes me snicker. The devil thought that he could keep, keep the Prince of Life in a tomb with a little stone in front of the entrance of the tomb with a Roman guard, with his demons there present in front of the tomb. He actually thought that he could keep Jesus in the tomb. And so one of the angels removes the stone and sits upon it. And the other angel stands in front of the tomb. And with a commanding voice, he says, O thou Son of God, thy Father calls thee. Remember, he had said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Immediately, out through the entrance of the tomb comes Jesus Christ. He had removed the wrappings and he had folded them neatly. See, he was a neat individual. This teaches us that we should make our bed, kids, in the morning. It teaches us many important lessons that we need to be orderly. See, he, he didn't say, oh, I've got to resurrect, you know, and just throw everything aside. No, he folded everything perfectly. And when he comes out of the tomb, he says in a commanding voice, I am the resurrection and the life. The Roman soldiers fell like they were dead. The demons scattered. The earth shook because the Messiah had come forth from the grave. Now he had a perfect life and he had a death for sin 
that he could offer, offer to every sinner that comes to him, repentant, confessing sin, and trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. But Jesus did not resurrect by himself. Our final point is that there was a group of individuals that resurrected with him. Notice Matthew chapter 27 verses 51 to 53. Matthew 27 verses 51 to 53. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And now notice, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. There was a multitude of individuals that resurrected with Christ, and the purpose was twofold. Number one, for 40 days to go into the city and prove that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. And secondly, when Jesus went to heaven 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus took these people who resurrected with him as a sample to heaven of all of those that will come forth from the grave when Jesus comes for the second time in power and glory. In other words, by taking that small group to heaven, Jesus is saying to the devil, I'm only taking the sample now, but when I return again, I'm going to take all of the rest of them with me as well. Now some people have reached the conclusion that this group that resurrected with Christ were the 24 elders of Revelation 4 and 5. But the question is, as we conclude this presentation, are those who resurrected with Jesus really the 24 elders, or are the 24 elders a different group who play a very important role in the plan of salvation? Don't miss the next exciting episode where we will study this subject.